So that was a bit of a challenge. I wasn't always able to express myself. And then even just little things, uh, food, culture, even the sense of humor, you know. Somebody makes a joke and everybody laughs except you because you didn't understand the joke. You can probably tell I have Tourette's syndrome. What would you say, what's helped you, Anthony? What's helped you to get through, to cope with um, the challenges associated with this? Um, I was audio girl, <laughs> so that was nice. Before we start, I'm planning on infiltrating a convention, so can everyone who said I needed a haircut in my last video send me money for a haircut? This is my PayPal. Like, even if you didn't, I'm, I'm not joking. I can't afford it. This cult is becoming more and more obsessed with making videos showcasing all kinds of indoctrinated members. So what happens when one of those indoctrinated members realizes that they are in a cult and decides to talk about it? What happens to their video? Well. They do what Stalin would do and cut that person out of the video to pretend they never existed, of course. Earlier this week, Larchwood approached me asking if I had a copy of the Gilead graduation from last year because the version in JW.org had been edited. And I just so happened nothing, okay? I had nothing. I edited this thing on a MacBook Air. I have to clear up my hard drive after every video to make room for the next one. I don't keep any clips. But using some sorcery only available to Larchwood, apparently, he ended up finding it after all. And now you can watch it in avoidjw.org. So let's watch an interview with the kind of guy who apparently becomes so mentally diseased with apostasy that his existence and the one of his wives have to be purged from this cult. I'll have minimum commentary so you can truly enjoy this clip that the Jehovah's Witnesses don't want you to see. We'd like to introduce our next guests, and they're coming from Ecuador, Alexandra and Anthony Sanseri. Anthony and Ali, welcome to the Inside Story. Thank you. Great to have you with us. Can you tell us you're both coming from the Ecuador branch? What are your assignments there? I work in the service department. And I work in the public information department. Okay. Anthony, I know you're not from Ecuador. So how did you get to Ecuador? Yeah, good question. When I was 15, I started learning Spanish with the idea that maybe I could serve somewhere where the need was great. And when I was 17, I started to hear about stories that a brother would send from Ecuador. Stories of how wonderful the preaching work was there, how much literature you could place, and all of his Bible studies. And it seemed amazing to me. At that point in my life, I didn't know there were still places like that on the earth. So I wrote back to him, and I think he could tell how interested I was, because then he invited me. He said, if you want to come serve with me, think about it. And so I did. When I was 18, I made my arrangements, and I went down to... Uh, to serve with him there. Great. So 18 years old, off to Ecuador. What was your, what was the plan? Well, the plan originally was to stay for one year. If I like it, I can just continue doing this. If I don't really like it very much, well, at least it was just a year and it was kind of a spiritual adventure and I, I would have a story to tell. You obviously have some stories to tell, the picture you've brought here. <laughs> yeah. So how did your plan go then? Even though the plan was for a year, I only made it six months. What happened? A few different things. First of all, I'm the oldest child in my family. We're all a very tight family, and so there was definitely some homesickness involved there. But also, it's uh, amazing how different one country can be from another. If you've never lived that experience, you maybe don't understand. I didn't speak the language perfectly, so that was a bit of a challenge. I wasn't always able to express myself. And then even just little things, uh, food, culture, even the sense of humor, you know. Somebody makes a joke and everybody laughs except you because you didn't understand the joke. And even though they look like little things, eventually they can kind of weigh on you. And then when my family let me know that they were missing me also, it wasn't too hard to convince me to just come home. So I only made it for six months. You're right. It's, I mean, living in another country is not an easy thing. Learning a new culture, so many things to adapt to. But I mean, you obviously went back to Ecuador. So how <laughs> did you get back to Ecuador? What happened? Well, when I went back home, I still had to answer the question of what I was going to do with my life. I, I didn't really know. So while I was in that time period, I opened up the latest watchtower at that time. And I was surprised to find an article about serving in a foreign field. I think we actually found the very article Yep, that's it. To my surprise, the whole article seemed to be about Ecuador. It was quotes from brothers that I knew personally. And to make the coincidence even greater, the cover 
picture to that article was of a family that had served in my congregation in Ecuador. I couldn't help but take it kind of as a sign from Jehovah that maybe I should think twice. And I started thinking about it and I realized that there was no real reason why I couldn't try again. So I decided to make plans and after six more months, I was able to go back to Ecuador. Nice, so you're back in Ecuador now um, serving and I guess it did turn out well. You, the two of you got married. <laughs> so Ali, what was your, as a young couple, what was your life like now in Ecuador together? Yeah, so when we got married, we went to serve up in the mountains of Ecuador. And that was, that was really an amazing experience. I always wanted to serve where the need was greater. And that's what we did for about 13 years. And then after um, those 13 years of regular pioneering, uh, we got invited to couple school. After that, we got sent a special pioneers. And this photo, yeah. this is from that assignment? Yeah, it was very interesting because we had to start from almost nothing, and that's out in the jungle. Good, and your next assignment then was circuit work, and this is one of your circuits? Yes, we got into the circuit work in 2015. In this particular one, we traveled like all around the country, yeah. and that was a beautiful experience also. We got to meet so many great friends. Okay, thanks very much. Now, I know you've had these, it looks like there's some great adventures in a sense and just a wonderful life as a couple serving Jehovah. But I know, Anthony, for you in particular, um, you've had some challenges. Yeah, no, that's true. Uh, one in particular I think I could mention is the fact that I, you can probably tell, I have Tourette syndrome. And that's basically an involuntary nervous disorder that creates uh, movements, tics, um, facial reactions, sometimes even vocalizations or sounds. Um, I used to have it a lot worse when I was younger. This photo you've brought, this is you. Yeah, that was me, <laughs> about when uh, we figured out what was going on. I tried a couple of different medicines that they had for it. Neither one seemed to really work, so I just decided, well, this is going to have to be me. I'll just have to live with it. <laughs> What would you say, what's helped you, Anthony? What's helped you to get through, to cope with um, the challenges associated with this? I think it was a couple of things. First of all, my family environment was always a safe place. In this regard, we could always talk openly about it. It's a hereditary uh, disorder, so my brother also has it. So we were all very comfortable with the idea. We could joke and everything. And at the same time, my parents always tried to instill in me a healthy sense of self-esteem that even though I was different in this area, it didn't mean I couldn't be good at other things, I couldn't be useful or helpful. Uh, for example, I remember my dad, when we were coming home from meeting in the car, he would talk to me from the front seat and he'd tell me, hey, that comment you gave today, you know, a brother came up to me and he told me that you did a great job and that made me feel really proud. And for a little boy to hear his dad say that, that was just amazing. So I always felt that from my family. And not just my family, also the congregation. I was able to compare the attitude of the congregation with the attitude I felt in the world sometimes. So I went through one really bad year of bullying in school. It was so bad that when the school year ended, I told my parents, I can't go back. I just can't. And I didn't. I homeschooled for several years after that. So I could contrast that with what I felt in the congregation. Because in the congregation, they never made me feel different. It's just love, right? It's love and acceptance like it is in every congregation. And I, one thing that helped was that a lot of my friends were more my parents' age than they would have been my age. And that was nice because even though they were older, they always included me. They always treated me kind of like as an equal. Um, they could joke with me. I could joke with them. And they also tried to instill in me a healthy sense of self-esteem. I remember... In one occasion, one of these brothers, he was conducting the second school. I had given a talk. And so after my talk, he gives me my counsel. He says, good job and all of that. But at the end, he said, now, just one thing I want to mention. He says, be careful with your timing. He says, because someday you're going to be on the platform giving a talk at a circuit assembly. And when you do, timing is very important. And, and I still remember the impact that that had in me. I was probably about 12 years old at the time. But for him to think that I might have the potential to give a talk at a circuit assembly was just amazing to me. So I think that environment helped me to eventually develop a healthy sense of self-esteem, which allowed me to, to go on and have a happy life. Thank you so much. I mean, those are great things. They're just small points, but, but I'm sure, Anthony, this, these are things that will really help a lot of brothers and sisters and a lot of friends coping with various challenges. I am wondering, though, because, I mean, I know you went into the circuit work, 
a circuit worker with a new congregation every week. Um, and that's a whole <laughs> congregation of people who don't know you. Yeah. How did that, what kind of challenge did that present for you? How did you deal with that? That was interesting. That was very interesting. <laughs> yeah. We just decided that we were going to get in front of it. We were going to yeah. take the initiative. I would say, for example, many of you have probably noticed, you know, and I would explain it to them, what it meant. Uh, I would always tell them, you know, it's like, first of all, I don't notice I'm doing it. Second, it doesn't hurt. Uh, third, you know, I would tell the kids, it's like when something itches and you have to scratch it. And if you don't scratch it, it doesn't quite feel right. Yeah, that always made sense. Yeah. And then they wouldn't ask any more questions and everybody felt okay. Yeah, but everybody felt at ease and they felt like they got to really know us. And, and that really helped with all of the visits. I'm sure it did. Well, you've had in your life a very, you know, rich life of service to Jehovah so far. And that's wonderful. What would you say are some, some lessons that you've learned? Well, in my case, I remember when we went to couple school, um, the brother from service department, he says, I want you to come to my office because I want to explain to you what your assignment is going to be. So when we opened our assignment, it did say that it was a group. I said, oh, so there's a group there. And he said, well, now there is. It's you two. <laughs> mm. So we had to go and find people. And after we looked for everybody in all the scatter sheep, it ended up being eight of us. So we had to rent an apartment where we could have meetings in our place. Um, Anthony had to give all of the parts, you know, during the week, on the weekends. Um, I was audio girl, <laughs> so that was nice. Uh, but you know, when there's like only eight people in your little group every week, um, and one person misses meeting or two people miss meeting, it's a big deal. And that really taught me that Every single person matters. And that was a really good lesson for us to learn because right after that, we got sent to a, to a circuit that had 2,500 people. So when you visit big congregations, you know, that are like 200 people, 250 people, it's very important to remember that, that every single person matters and you're there for them. That's a great, great thought, yeah, a great lesson that everyone's important and we never want to lose anyone. Very nice. What about you, Anthony? What would you say? I think a big lesson that we've learned over the years is the importance of being flexible with your plans or with what you're trying to accomplish with your circumstances. I know you have a great, you've got a great story associated with that. Can you tell us? Yeah, if I could, it, it illustrates the point pretty well. So when we were accepted into Bethel in 2019, shortly thereafter, we were assigned to represent Bethel at a circuit assembly out on the jungle side of, of Ecuador. And in Ecuador, that means climbing the Andes Mountains and then coming back down the other side of the Andes Mountains. So as we were coming back down the other side, we came around a corner on the highway and we were faced with a wall of mud. Yeah. It was the morning of the assembly. There was no other way around. And that area was so remote, it didn't even have cell service. So where do you go? So we didn't know what else we could do except just walk park the car and walk over the top? The branch car or your car? It was the branch car. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, we... yeah, we did have to find a place where we could tell like, okay, there's no gonna be any mountain falling on it. Okay, then we left it there and we just started walking. <laughs> we made it to the other side of the mountain, as you can see there. Finally, this guy came in this little motorcycle. And I guess he must have seen the desperation in my eyes because he was, when he saw the mountain, he was about to turn around and he's like, do you guys want to? Well, yes, yes, we want you to please take us. And then the three of us, well, the two of us with him got on this little tiny motorcycle mm -hmm. and he took us. And then we finally made it to one little town where we could borrow a phone. We called our friend, we told him, yes, we are coming. We took a taxi and we explained to the taxi driver, like, we need to be there like in 20 minutes. Could you make it? And he's like, oh, I think I can make it. Mm -hmm. So that and was... he did his best. <laughs> well, you challenged him. Yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we pulled up to the stadium where they were holding the assembly five minutes before I had to give my talk. I went running into the assembly and, and one complication was that this was going to be an interpreted talk. So I ran into the assembly and I said, OK, I'm here. Where's my interpreter? And he, the brother comes running over. He's nervous and I'm nervous. And we start talking. And as we're talking about the talk, I stop and I look down. And there were these two brothers from the assembly on their hands and knees, cleaning the mud off of my shoes. You were wearing shoes at that point. I was wearing, was shoes, wearing shoes, but they were pretty muddy. <laughs> so 
when I saw that happening, it was just kind of a moment for me. It was a moment of reflection because it, maybe if I can back up just a little bit. When I said I only stayed six months in the country the first time, it is true. Homesickness and all of those things were a big part of it. But also I had a fairly traumatic experience uh, trying to preach in an indigenous community. That was the same indigenous community that was now having a native language circuit assembly. And I, I reflected on the contrast, whereas 20 some years ago, mm -hmm. there really was very little progress. And if anything, it was, it was very, very challenging, very difficult. And then you fast forward 20 years, and now you have an entire assembly of native speakers, many publishers in this, in this language, half of a circuit in this language. And here's these two brothers that now are showing this most beautiful, humble attitude to be willing to clean my shoes so that I can go and give a talk. And it just kind of made me think that, you know, you can't rush things. You can't force it if it's not Jehovah's time. But when it is, it just comes naturally. So the best thing you can do is just roll with the unexpected. Thank you so much. I mean, it's a great experience, but they're two really nice lessons for us, to roll with the unexpected and to never forget that everyone is important. Ali and Anthony, thank you so much for being with us on The Inside Story. And we wish you Jehovah's blessing in your assignment. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I originally did not react to this video in my recap of the Galia graduation because this video kind of just made me depressed. Here was a very nice guy and his lovely wife who seemed to be very nice to victims of microaggressions and using their story of exploitation to try and exploit others. But remember, this is the kind of person that the leadership has followers to completely shun if they speak against the cult. All of this love is completely conditional. I would obviously love to interview Anthony Sanseri, but I haven't been able to find any public profile of him. So if you know him or are him, reach out to me. I would love to hear why this call decided to delete you from their archives. But for now, you can join my Patreon if you want to read how I'm planning on infiltrating a convention. I'll upload some details in a couple of days.